Welcome back to the Presbyterian Journey. I'm the Reverend Lucas Levy Keppel. I'm glad you're here with me today. This is the third major section of our series. This time, Always Being Reformed is our title. This is also the ninth episode overall. By now, I'm sure you know that we can't spend too long on any one topic. So if you have questions about the content of this video, please leave a comment or reach out to your pastor, who I'm sure can offer you some more resources than we can here. Last week, we took a look at the Reformed faith in Germany in the 20th century and the creation of the Barman Declaration, protesting the actions of the German Christian movement associated with the Nazis. This week, we're heading back to the United States, specifically to the border between Indiana and Kentucky on the Ohio River in that Ohio River Valley. There in the city of Louisville, we find the building that is the headquarters of the Presbyterian Church USA, sometimes affectionately called the Mothership. It houses most of the paid staff of the denomination, from the stated clerk to the General Assembly Mission Council. Everyone except the Historical Society and the Board of Pensions in Philadelphia and the Office of Public Witness in Washington, D.C. Louisville may seem like an odd place for a denominational headquarters. After all, Kentucky is considered by many to be one of the flyover states from those that have coastal mindsets. But in 1983, when the Presbyterian Church USA formed officially out of the northern UPC USA and the southern PC US, the most important thing was to find a headquarters that privileged neither side. The UPC USA had been headquartered in New York, while the PC US had its head in Georgia. Louisville struck a balance between the two, a compromise reminiscent of the compromises in polity and administration that were the focus of the day. It was a long time arriving, this merger of the major Presbyterian churches in the United States. After the splintering of the church in the Civil War and the controversies of side, light, and school, uh, it was hoped that the three major branches would reunite in 1954. Talks had been underway for years at that point, but the PCUS failed to ratify the decision that year, uh, primarily over the issue of desegregation in schools and society. Still, the other two branches went ahead with the merge, and ecumenical relations were maintained throughout the 20th century. For example, a joint effort with the Reformed Church in America and the Associate Reformed Presbyterians, a unified hymnal entitled The Hymn Book, was published in 1955. Its red cover would be found in churches from all across the denomination and in its sister denominations as well. Its purchase by churches uh, satisfied the licensing fees for the hymns within, supporting musicians writing new music and hymn texts alongside the old favorites. The success of the hymn book was followed with the Book of Common Worship in 1966, an effort to offer templates of services that followed the directory for worship which was updated again in 1991 and 2018. In the years leading up to the reunification, it was not uncommon for churches to belong to presbyteries in both the northern and southern churches. Indeed, the church that I currently serve, Trinity Presbyterian Church in Bixby, Oklahoma, uh, was chartered to be a part of presbyteries of both churches at the same time. This was before the unification in 1980. By the 1980s, the differences between the denominations had shrunk, although each had their idiosyncrasies to work out. To help bring the denominations together, the General Assembly called for a new statement of faith to be written with the intent to have a more poetic statement that might be able to be used in worship alongside the Nicene and Apostles' creeds. A committee of 21 was set up in 1985, chosen for a diversity of voices, including women and men, members, elders, ministers, Anglos and non-Anglos, uh, professors and poets. They spent years studying the other confessions, looking for more details and ways that they could bring this forward into the end of the 20th and the beginning of the 21st century. There was a constant tension between the Puritans and the poets, as was written in the day. In 1988, the first public draft of what would become the Brief Statement of Faith was released. It received over 15,000 responses, both from within the denomination and from other denominations who were interested in the process. 
Amazingly, 88% of those responses affirmed the draft as it stood. And those who critiqued it fell roughly equally across all of the theological spectrum. Still, a revisory committee of 15 was set up to uh, help make some changes that might make things a little bit more sensible uh, and more user-friendly. This revisory committee consisted of 10 ministers, 3 laypersons, and 3 professors. Together with the committee of 21, they spent the five months that they had together revising that draft until it was presented to General Assembly in 1990. It was approved with over 94% of the vote, an amazing feat in a newly united denomination. But enough about how it came to be, what does the brief statement of faith actually say? Despite being much shorter than most of the other confessions, uh, the brief statement touches on a lot of theological points starting with an echo of the Westminster Confession. In life and in death, we belong to God. From there, it describes Trinitarian monotheism, that God is simultaneously three and one. It upholds the doctrine of justification of grace through faith, supports the authority of scripture, and lifts up the sovereignty of God. It points out that the means of election are not just for salvation, but also to call us to service of God and one another. And it explicitly notes that Jewish people are the children of God's covenant. It is the first confession to include Jesus' ministry in addition to his death and resurrection. The first confession to explicitly affirm human equality, especially across gender lines. The brief statement of faith serves as a model for the newer confessions of the church and how committee written statements can be affirmed by the wider church. As often as the church has split and joined back together, the brief statement in my mind acts as a sort of glue reminding us of why we joined in the first place. In the banner designed for this confession, you can see the hands of God holding together a broken world set against the rainbow of colors of the beautiful, diverse wonders of creation together in the unity of God. It's on that note that we will end today's episode. Next week is our final episode of the series when we turn to Sarasota, Florida and a look at what might be in the future of the Presbyterian journey. Thank you for joining me today. May you serve Christ in your daily tasks and live a holy and joyful life.